Hello everyone and welcome to this brief presentation on the life and ideas of David Boom inspired by the film Infinite Potential. So what you're gonna see is a map that displays some of the events and discoveries that mark the life and work of physicist and philosopher David Boom which has been described as one of the most significant theoretical physicists of the 20th century. Um, among other things, he has created solid ontological and epistemological frameworks that allows us to better understand the wholeness and interconnected of the universe. Here we have more information about the map itself, uh, the film that inspired it, as well as the timeline um, that were used that was used for the creation of the map so let's begin so we start when David Boone was born uh, and he was born in Pennsylvania uh, to a Hungarian Jewish immigrant father Samuel Boom and a Lithuanian Jewish mother uh, he was raised mainly by his father which owned a furniture store and was the assistant of the local rab rabbi. Uh, and despite being raised in a Jewish family, he became an agnostic in his teenager years. And uh, from the Infinite Potential film, we get that despite his father's disincentive for his interest in thinking and science, Boom was an excellent student, writing his unified theory of the cosmos integrating mind and matter while still at school, which is pretty impressive. This then led him to Penn State University, where he graduated as a physics major in 1939. And then his exceptional abilities in mathematics and physics secured secure him a scholarship at Caltech, where he attended as a graduate student for one year, uh, still in 39. And it was there at Caltech that Boom met Oppenheimer, uh, one of the most prominent physicists of the last century, who was sufficiently impressed with him to arrange for him to transfer to University of Berkeley, where Oppenheimer headed up the physics department. And at Berkeley, Boom taught physics and condu conducted research in plasma, the synchrotron, and the synchrocyclotron. Um, and uh, we get from the film that with a sense of rejection for his own father, Boom has sought father figures, and it was clear that Robert Oppenheimer was to fulfill that role. Uh, so not only was Oppenheimer a uh, mentor for Boom, but also this father figure um, due to his family uh, upbringing. And then we see the story unfolding here uh, where uh, Boom's mathematical calculations proved useful to the Manhattan Project in the building of the first atomic bomb. Uh, however, there were many um, issues around this event and Boom was denied security clearance uh, to the Manhattan Project due to uh, previous uh, leanings with the Communist Party in the United States. Uh, because of that, he lost access to his own work and making it impossible for him to complete his thesis. But even without completing and defending his thesis, Oppenheimer at the time had scientists at the Lo Los Alamos laboratory granted Boom his PhD as a way out of this uh, situation. And this all happened around uh, in the early 40s. And that was also the time when Boom started working on the theory of plasma in metals. And here we got a short description from Andrea Barbieri, uh, which was uh, an artist uh, who worked in the in the Infinite Potential film, uh, where he describes this work of Boom, defining plasma as one of the four fundamental states of the matter, 
uh, a collection of free electrons moving within a positively charged metal lattice and then boom apply plasma theory to a completely different area metals so atoms in a metal arrange themselves in a regular lattice pattern leaving their outer electrons relatively free moving through the lattice and these electrons end up behaving like a gas and Boone thought this gas of electrons inside of a metal had a plasma-like nature and so he developed this idea further into a theory which um, proved his worth to the scientific community at the time uh, and granted his space in that um, in that realm so ex after this uh, successful work on the theory of plasma, uh, Boone was offered a job at Princeton University. Uh, he became an assistant professor there. And what's interesting about this event is that at Princeton, uh, Boone took a room in a house next door to Einstein, developing an intimate professional and personal relationship with him to the point where Einstein Einstein came to call Boom his spiritual son, uh, which we can imagine the grandiosity of uh, such a uh, such an event. It was also around this time uh, that Boom's communist leanings, um, coupled with concerns that Los Alamos about possible leaks of classified information to the Russians, was to impact dramatically on his life within physics and we will see how so in 1951 uh, Bohm uh, wrote uh, one of his first books quantum theory which was a summary of the understanding of quantum theory at a at the time uh, and an interesting thing here is that he was asked to give a lecture on quantum theory and he then uh, said at the end that he didn't really understand it so he decided to write a book about it because that's uh, the best way to go about something you don't fully understand and this book ended up being one of the best standard books uh, on the topic uh, up until now however around the same year um, we had an event that was to change uh, the entire course of his life. So he did not agree to testify against his colleagues under the Macar McCarthyism. So he was put in a trick polit political situation where he was arrested and then released. Uh, and because of that, the principal of, principal of Princeton banned him from the campus. Uh, many of the scientists at the time tried to intervene in his favor, uh, but Oppenheimer, which was uh, probably one of the most powerful uh, scientists at that time, uh, we're talking uh, post-World post War, uh, Oppenheimer objected. Uh, and then we have a quote from the film. Uh, in fact, Oppenheimer saw Boom in Princeton once and said, I thought I asked you to get out of the country. And given Oppenheimer's power at the time, uh, Boom had no choice but to leave for exile. And with the help of friends, including Einstein, he was welcomed at Sao Paulo University in Brazil. And there he was a physics teacher, but also a prominent figure in the advance of Brazilian science, uh, up until now recognized as that. So he arrived in Brazil in 1951. And it was also, uh, it was actually around here uh, in, in Brazil that he had time to look at the impasse between Einstein and Niels Bohr with new perspectives uh, in a paper called Hidden Variables, which came to be one of the fundamentals, fundamental papers of his life. Uh, he had really questioned the orthodox interpretation uh, on quantum theory and decided to develop his own approach which he called hidden variables and here in the map we have um, a definition of, of what this hidden variables approach was and it, it stated that the behavior of quantum particles were not chance process 
for the motion of electrons were guided by underlying pilot waves, uh, especially here referring to the double slit experiment. And one curious thing is that when Boone finished his paper and he sent it for publica publication, he believed that it would act as a shock wave to physicists all over the world. However, he heard nothing, and that made him really shocked over why there was no reaction to his paper. And then we see here in the map that uh, there is a connection, that Oppenheimer has a connection to that. Uh, and in fact, there was a Princeton student who read Boom's paper at the time and took it to Oppenheimer. Uh, the student said that nobody was discussing the paper and asked what was wrong with it. Uh, when open and then open Oppenheimer responded at nothing so he Oppenheimer called a conference inviting the leading physicists to discuss Bohm's paper and find a flaw in the argument um, and one of the one of the key points of this conference is that Oppenheimer um, stated that if we cannot disprove Bohm uh, then we must agree to ignore him uh, well, they could not disprove him, and in fact, the hidden variables paper was ignored by the orthodox uh, for the physics orthodoxy for quite a while, um, being regarded as uh, simply wrong for no apparent reason. So, after all of this, um, Boom was also very unhappy. In Brazil, he never really adapted and never really settled in this uh, new territory. So uh, with the newfound state of Israel, he was offered a position as a research fellow at the Technion, uh, the Israel Institute of Technology. So he moved there, he moved country and institution in 1955. It was while in Israel and actually in the beginning of his stay there that he met Sarah uh, Sarah Wolfson. Uh, they met in a par in a party shortly after Boone arrived, and they soon got married, um, which also came to impact Boone's trajectory later on. And after a short stay in Israel, Boone moved to Bristol, and it was here or there that his fundamental ideas on the nature of reality began to take fresh impetus. It was but also before moving he published his book Causality and Chance in Mother Physics in 1950, 1957. Uh, the same year he moved to Bristol and started working as a research fellow in that institution. So why in England why in England uh, Sarah and Boone had this um, th th this common habit of going to the library and it was during one of these visits to the library that Sarah came across a book from Krishnamurti that discussed the interactions between observer and observed. This was obvious, obviously of deep interest for Boom, due to his conclusions that because of the wholeness of the universe, these two cannot be separated, especially in the quantum world. Um, it was also around this time uh, that Boom uh, worked on together with physicist Aharonov uh, on what was became to known as the Aharonov Boone effect, uh, which at the time was um, uh, was thought to be uh, a, a theory or a discovery uh, worth of a Nobel Prize. Uh, here we have a short description of it. So the Aharonov Boone effect uh, is a quantum mechanical phenomenon in which an electrically charged particle is affected by an, uh, by an electromagnetic potential. Despite being confined to a region in which both the magnetic field and electric field are zero, the underlying mechanism is the coupling of the electromagnetic potential with the complex phase of a charged particle's wave function. And this effect is accordingly illustrated by the interference, by interference experiments. So we can already see how this relates, for example, with the uh, with his earlier uh, hidden variable work, uh, even though it's not explicitly uh, put it that way. So moving forward, um, 
It was also in Bristol that Boone left his hidden variables idea behind and was uh, now focusing on the fact that despite decades of work, physicists had been unable to reconcile quantum theory with Einstein's relativity. Uh, a grandiose task, uh, to, to say simply. And so he was wondering, do we need a new theory? Uh, is that the issue? Or is it a completely new order to physics, a new approach? And that was what he began to think about, what he called the implicate order. Uh, quoting him, we need a radically new order. And then here we have um, on the map a node that talks about the implicate and explicate orders, which come from uh, his uh, line of thinking. So quoting from the Infinite Potential blog, um, in his theory of the undivided universe, Boom posited that the whole of reality is a nesting of increasingly subtle layers. Our most immediate and familiar layer is what, we, is what he called explicate. Beyond it were the layers of the implicate, the super implicate, and perhaps many more layers, each progressively more subtle, more general, and more powerful. Uh, we also have here a long definition from Wiki Wikipedia, which you can check here. Uh, but in short, it, it says that all of what we see, uh, space and time themselves, uh, are not exactly the dominant factors, are not the dominant factors determining the relationships of dependence or, in or independence of different elements. Rather, an entirely different sort of basic connection of elements is possible from which our ordinary notions of space and time, along with those of separately existing material particles, are abstracted as forms derived from the deeper order. These ordinary notions, in fact, appear in what's called the explicate, or unfolded order, which is a special and distinguished form contained within the general totality of all the implicate orders. So what Boone is saying here is that uh, the way reality works, or the way it is structured, is that uh, there are different layers of uh, reality, even reality, really, uh, where in in the where what we experience uh, in terms of the material world is part of this uh, explicit order, uh, but this explicit order is deeply connected and influenced by more subtle uh, orders of, of existence, which are the, the implicate ones. Uh, and also he goes on about the super implicate and other uh, more subtle orders. So to quote him, I propose that each moment of time is a projection from the total implicate order. As if, as with consciousness, each moment has a certain explicate order, and in addition, it enfolds all the others, though in its own way. So the relationship of each moment in the whole to all the others is implied by its total content, the way in which it holds all the others enfolded with it, within it. Uh, here he's basically saying that uh, parts and whole are intrinsic, intrinsically connected meaning that uh, any particular location or any uh, particular particle in the explicate order uh, has enfolded in it uh, the whole of the implicate order. Uh, so we can see that these are radical ideas even for our times, and that's what he was proposing um, in, the, in the 60s uh, when quantum physics was still taking shape as a, as a subject that would impact our lives. So moving forward, uh, we have here that David Boone and Krishnamurti finally meet in June 1961. Uh, and after a first encounter, they became very close to the point where Boone quickly became a trustee at Krishnamurti's school at Brockwood Park. They, and then there they enter a series of conversations whose themes cover the ending of time, the nature of mind, cosmic order, 
and much more over a 25 year period so the book that Sarah discovered uh, in 59 deeply inspired Boone to the point where he was really uh, interested in meeting uh, this Indian philosopher Krishnamurti and after they met they formed this very strong relationship uh, that unfolded in many different projects uh, and collaborations together, including Boone uh, being part of the of the board for Brockwood Park School, funded by Krishnamurti. And it was also in 1961 that oh sorry that Boone moved to Birkberg College uh, in the University of London where uh, he started working as a professor of theoretical physics and it was also at that time that he met his longtime collaborator uh, Basil Hiley and he received uh, it was a big Brick college that Boone formed one of his most enduring science partnerships uh, with physicist Basil Hiley which, which uh, deeply uh, influenced his work on the implicate and explicate orders uh, taking it steps further and here we have an interview with uh, Basil Hiley for uh, for the Scientific American uh, uh, magazine. Uh, I'm not going to go through it uh, throughout, but you can check later on on the map. Uh, you can also check the profiles of all of these people uh, here. Uh, they are on the map as well. But the important thing to uh, say here, and this is a quote from Basil Hiley, is that while at Big Book College, uh, Boom was developing a new idea which was called structure process uh, that basically we want to start things we want to start looking at the w the universe uh, with process and not particles moving through space-time but a process from which both particles and space-time can emerge uh, very radical ideas uh, and ideas that were then again uh, feedback to influence the implicate and explicate orders uh, that became a fundamental pillar of his work. And here we have from Wikipedia the, the notion of implicate and explicate orders emphasizes the primacy of structure and process over individual objects. The later are seen as mere approximations of an underlying process. In this approach, quantum quantum particles and other objects are understood to have only a limited degree of stability and autonomy. So we see how the, the idea of structure process uh, came to influence the concepts of the implicate and explicate orders. So moving forward, 1965, uh, Bohm uh, writes or publishes the book, The Special Theory of Relativity, and it's also the year where he, um, oh no, that was, sorry, uh, 65, and then years later, actually, uh, actually in, in 71, uh, that's when he meets uh, David Peet, which also becomes one of his long, uh, lifelong collaborators. Uh, here we also have a quote from Wikipedia uh, saying that, what the two have accomplished together, such as uh, writing the book Science, Order, and Creativity. Uh, also, Pete later wrote Boom's biography, Infinite Potential, The Life and Times of David Boom. Uh, this biography was uh, an inspiration for the film. And in the context of this biography, Pete emphasizes how Boom had worked intensely on finding a mathematical expression for his vision of an interconnected unfolded implicate order from each an explicate order the world of classical physics unfolds Boone also aimed at reintroduce time as a dynamic entity so here we see again the role of the implicate and explicate orders in the work of Boone uh, and the relationship between these two so that's 1971 if we go one step further here we have uh, a big new chunk to our map uh, just to make things easier, uh, if we put here, we will highlight what this uh, is representing. So from Infinite Potential Film, 
It had been decades since the physics orthodoxy had black ball boom and his hidden variables. Uh, and it would take a new team of maverick scientists to unearth this critical work and resurrect it to a new generation. And that's what Chris, uh, Chris Dooney uh, was an absolute master at, uh, was actually developing computer programs to actually simulate this and, let's, and let us have a look at what's going on here. So what's being simulated? Uh, exactly the hidden variables paper. So around uh, this time, we're talking 72, uh, they finally developed sufficient computing power uh, needed to run the complex mathematics require, required to describe uh, Boone's hidden variables. And this work was conducted by Chris uh, Dooney um, and other uh, members of his team at Big Brook College working under the supervision of Basil Hailey. Um, and here we see uh, a autobiography by Chris where he says that he was the first to apply the Brookley Boone theory, quantum theory, uh, which is the hidden variables, uh, to carry out detailed calculations through computer simulations of the well-defined motions of individual quantum particles, of individual quantum systems. I made innovative, innovative use of early computer-generated movie technology to present animations of particle motions during interference measurement. And then here again, we're talking about the double slit experiment. Uh, and the work that Chris developed was on uh, creating simulations that would, uh, com creating computer simulations that would simulate uh, the behavior of uh, quantum particles going through the double slit experiment, um, but rather following trajectories, trajectories informed by mathematically informed by the hidden variables proposed by Boom um, in 1952, so 20 years later, 20 years before. And this is what Chris uh, says in the, in the movie about this. Uh, you, you could actually see in the images that we produce exactly how you could have particle trajectories in the two-slit experiment and account for interference. You could follow individual particles as it was affected by this potential through space, and the quantum potential would guide the particles into the bright interference fringes. He, David, saw these trajectories and this quantum potential, and his eyes actually lit up, because he had not seen them. He had written about it, but he had not seen them. And then we started discussing the quantum potential. What could it mean? So these are the images uh, from the movie. We see here the double slit experiment, uh, the particles going through one of the slits, remembering that the particles here, they, they manifest the, the duality particle, wave particle duality. Um, so they do not behave like particles in the sense that they would uh, go through the two slit and then scatter randomly in the background, but rather they, they create these um, interference patterns that, that uh, would make one think that the, these are waves that, that are being observed and not particles. But in the end, these are particles with uh, wave particle duality. And what this um, simulation shows is that there is this um, quantum potential here, or this potential that informs the trajectory of the particles and explains how the interference patterns emerge. Um, so after this has been shown, uh, after the hidden variables have been uh, simulated, then the question was, what is this potential that is informing the trajectory of the particles? So from here, we go to the quantum potential idea, uh, which is the idea of an infor information potential, which informs the very manifestation and behavior of particles in the quantum world. Um, very deep concept, which also has many implications <laughs> for the implicate and explicate orders, uh, as we can see here. 
So from Wikipedia, in line with David Bloom's approach, Basil Haile and mathematician Maurice de Gossun show that the quantum potential can be seen as a consequence as a consequence of a projection of an underlying structure, more specifically of non-commutative al algebraic structure onto a subspace onto a subspace such as ordinary space. In algebraic terms, the quantum potential can be seen as arising from the relationship between implicate and explicate orders. So it's almost as if um, in, in this uh, conception of reality where the explicate order is what we experience as the material world and the implicate order is a deeper order, more subtle that informs it, it's also as, as if the quantum potential is the interface between these two orders, uh, informing what manifests from the, uh, the implicate order into the explicate order. Uh, that's the way I've come about uh, this. And also from the Infinite Potential film, uh, Bone suggests that out of perceived emptiness, out of the so-called vacuum state, particles interact with, respond to, and are informed by an information potential which allows the cosmos to emerge. It is the informing action of the quantum potential that makes it possible for the physical universe to be. Everything we know and everything we'll come to know is already in formation, waiting to, un waiting to unfold into manifest reality. Is the implicate waiting to become explicate? Uh, so we see very deep uh, ideas, very deep concepts, uh, but with some substantial um, hypothetical um, background uh, by the work of physicists and mathematicians. And all of this leads us to, uh, or has led uh, physicists at the time to discuss uh, the notion of non-locality. So the quantum potential uh, influenced that idea and what is non-locality? Uh, and, and then here we get from Bechran Magazine the definition that it's usually now called quantum entanglement, which quantum particles are shown to transmit information instantaneously from one end of the universe to the other across space and time. So non-locality uh, basically means that there is um, this phenomena in which uh, elements of reality, particles per se, which are very distant from each other, uh, have a, a deep connection to each other and a, and a connection that transcends the speed of light uh, in the sense that changes in one uh, of these elements in one of these particles uh, instantaneously manifests in another one. So uh, giving the idea that there might be another layer of reality or another order where these two particles or these two elements are connected uh, and the quantum potential being the interface between that order and what we see as manifest. So all of this is what I have highlighted here as the hidden variables um, uh, the technical term in the map is the loop, but we can think about it as the hidden variables chapter in Boone's life. Uh, so it has all of these elements that are shown here. And uh, we can see that it has uh, deep, implicates, <laughs> deep implications for our understanding of reality and, and everything that unfolds from it. Uh, and the hidden variables, uh, as well as the quantum potential, and non-locality are topics of interest in physics, in physics up until today, uh, with the quantum potential still uh, being a topic of experiments, especially at Birkbach College, uh, where physicists led by Basil Haile are trying to prove its existence, uh, which would then prove um, the existence of this uh, implicate order that we've been talking about. So this all happened in 1972, uh, 20 years later after the event with Hidden Variables paper. Uh, and of course, uh, a big pillar of uh, David Boone's work. So let's see what's next. It was also while he was at Bikuba College that uh, he first met the Dalai Lama. Uh, so from Wikipedia, we get that on his first trip to the West, in 73, the Dalai, the, Dalai, the Dalai Lama asked to visit 
Cambridge University's astrophysicists, astrophysics department in the UK, and he was sought out, and he sought out renowned scientists such as uh, David Bohm, uh, who taught him the basics of science. And since this first encounter, Boone and the Dalai Lama have participated in other dialogues and panels on science and spirituality, uh, to the point where the Dalai Lama has come to call Boone his uh, science guru, which I think is a pretty uh, big thing uh, for one person, um, which was called by Einstein his spiritual son, and the Dalai Lama his science guru. So that's uh, 73, moving forward. Uh, in 98, uh, Boom published his book, uh, Wholeness and the Implicate Order, which is probably his most uh, known work and a big summary of his entire life's work. Um, and also in this book, he introduces the concept of the real mode language. So, uh, basically, um, Boom tried to develop an experimental approach to language, uh, a new mode of using existing languages, uh, which he called the real mode. From the Greek real to flow, this approach was based upon his thesis that it might be possible for the syntax and grammatical form of language to be changed so as to give a basic role to the verb rather than the noun. Uh, why is this um, why is this relevant? Because um, from his uh, entire work on on uh, the wholeness of the universe and on the importance of process as opposed to objects, Boone has come, and also um, the role of 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 consciousness and language. Uh, which he debated so much with Krishnamurti, uh, Boon has come to the understanding that our languages, our Western languages mainly, uh, have a flaw in them, which is the focus on nouns, the focus on objects. Um, so he had this thought experiment, um, which developed into the real mode, where a more fluid uh, verb-based language would allow us to achieve a different a different sort of a different kind of consciousness a different kind of perception of reality which will be more attuned to the way uh, reality uh, deeply works uh, ultimately works so that's where the real mode age the real mode language came from uh, and it was introduced in 1980 in the wholeness and the implicate order book so moving forward we have that uh, Boone was also a distinguished visiting professor at Syracuse University uh, in 92. It was here that he and David Peet planned a series of essays that, will, that would then become Science, Order, and Creativity, a, a book. And um, we also get from, from Wikipedia the Boom also spoke to audiences across Europe and North America on the importance of dialogue as a form of social therapy, a concept he bor bro borrowed from London psychiatrist and practi practi sorry, practitioner of group analysis, Pat DeMar. And this idea of dialogue became a huge part of his later, uh, later life. He even developed uh, a whole set of procedures which were later known as the uh, Boone Dialogue, uh, which were consistent of uh, freely f free flowing uh, group conversations in which participants attempt to reach a common understanding, experiencing everyone's point of view fully, equally, and non judgmentally. This could lead to a new and deeper understanding. The purpose was to solve the communication crisis that faced society. And indeed, and indeed, the whole of human nature and consciousness. It further it uses sorry, <laughs> it utilizes a theoretical understanding of the way thoughts relate to universal reality, and it was named after him, who originally proposed this dialogue. Uh, so, in short, here uh, also coming from his understanding of consciousness and how reality works, uh, boom. Uh, push forward the idea that uh, 
free-flowing dialogue with no uh, end goal, with no uh, resolution required, was a form for groups uh, and people to experience or to experiment with, uh, let's call it the unfolding uh, process of, of collective, collectively intelligence. Uh, also a process that would be more attuned to the way reality works uh, itself. Uh, so he says, in dialogue, insofar as we have no purpose and no agenda, and we don't have to do anything, we don't really need to have an authority or a hierarchy. Rather, we need a place where there is no authority, no hierarchy, where there is no special purpose, sort of an emp empty place where we can let anything be talked about. This is the kind of setting that uh, he found to be nurturing uh, of, uh, of processes that would allow us to experience uh, the sort of fluidity and, and wholeness of, that he has described in his work. So this is uh, around the 1980s uh, when the Boone Dialogue became a thing and there were many instances of Boone Dialogue across uh, many, many different countries with many different people. And then moving forward, we have that in 1987, he publishes Science, Order and Creativity, the book he worked with David Pete uh, at Syracuse University. And it's also the year of his retire retirement, uh, and where where he retires from Brickburg College uh, of the University of London. And then finally, we move to the end of the map and the presentation, um, where we get uh, a connection from his retirement and and his death. And then Wikipedia put it this way: uh, Boom continued work, continued his work in quantum theory in quantum physics after his retirement in 1987. His final work, the posthumously publish the post sorry, the posthumously publish The Undivided Universe, an ontological interpretation of quantum theory, resulted from a decades long collaboration with Basil Hailey. Near the end of his life, Bohm began to experience a recur recurrence of the depression that he had suffered earlier in his life. He was admitted to the Maudsley Hospital in South London on 10 May 1991. His condition worsened, worsened and it was decided that the only treatment that might help him was electroconvulsive therapy. Boom showed improvements from the treatments and was released on 29 August but his depression returned and was treated and then he was treated with medication and then Boone died after suffering a heart attack heart attack in Hinden London on 27 October 1992 at 74 the curious thing about his death was that uh, as we see from the movie uh, the day uh, that he had the heart attack he was working with his longtime collaborator uh, Basil Hailey at Birkberg College and just before he left his office he telephoned his wife and was quite excited saying I feel I'm on the edge of something so this is the end of the presentation um, uh, the map was created as part of a of materials for a project uh, on on Coursera, but the map itself is uh, has no copyright copyrights. However, all of the information in, in it has been taken from uh, mostly the Infinite Potential film, uh, as well as the adjacent material from the film uh, and it, Wikipedia itself. The main idea and purpose of this uh, map and presentation was to uh, highlight some uh, of the main uh, points brought in the in the film and also further uh, explore them uh, using different references and, and different definitions for uh, David Boone's work uh, a, a, a life and, and a work that 
at least uh, in the opinion of this presenter, has never been so important, given our urgent need to understand and reconcile uh, our perception of reality for the challenges that we face, which are challenges that connect us all uh, in this uh, experience of life, uh, especially on this planet. So I hope that this presentation at least sparked some interest on David Boone's work and for more detailed explanations of his ideas uh, and theories, uh, one could use the map that was created for this presentation uh, to navigate. Uh, the link for this map is, the, is in the description of this video, but also all of the references uh, that were used uh, are also amazing sources for uh, further, in further inquiry. And of course, the film Infinite Potential, which has deeply inspired uh, this presentation and this work, as well as uh, its creator. So thank you for watching, and I really hope you have enjoyed it. Bye-bye.